Amen. You can be seated. What we've been doing over the course of the summer is just taking some time to look at some of the aspects of what we want our culture to be marked by. You could call it core values. You could call it culture. What are the things that we do around here? What are we about scripturally? What is automatic? What is just the things, our reflexes of what we do as a church? And so we've been working through these nine things, and my hope is that by giving some attention to each one of these each Sunday, um, we might see them grow in terms of the life of our church. But it's just by giving some attention to them and sort of seeing and, and getting a vision for who we are to be as the people of God at Redeeming Grace Church, uh, that by giving attention to each one of these qualities, um, that we might see them grow, that we might be able to give attention to them in our own lives and in our church. And so here's just a list of what they are. Um, maybe it looks like a lot, but I think these are biblical, and I think this is what God calls his church to be about. Uh, the first one we looked at was compelling exposition. We make the word of God central by preaching it with passion and clarity. We looked last week as we want to be a people that are about relentless prayer. We trust God in all things, therefore we go to him in all circumstances. Today we're going to look at joyful worship. We express our heartfelt praise to God. And you could kind of group those first three under the idea of enjoy, enjoying God through his word, enjoying God through prayer, enjoying God in worship. And so as you think about those three, those really sort of flesh out what we mean when we say we want to enjoy, display, and share God's redeeming grace with the world. These next three really are, you could put under the subheading of, of defining what it means to, in, to, uh, uh, to display. Uh, we'll look at meaningful membership. We show our love for Jesus by making a real commitment to his bride, the church. Serious discipleship, we want to go all out in our pursuit of being transformed by Jesus. Eager generosity, we delight in opportunities to steward what God has given us for the good of others, our time, our talent, our treasure. We want to use that well uh, to see other people worshiping God. And then share in, in compassionate service. Um, we look not to be served, but to serve as Jesus has served us. Genuine hospitality. We share not just the gospel, but our lives and homes with others, and ultimately patient endurance. We fight for one another in all trials, temptations, and troubles of life. We just have a doggedness, so we're going to stick together as much as we can through the challenges. And so those are the nine things we want just to be automatic. Like it's just, if you're a part of Redeeming Grace Church, you go, this is what we're about. This is what we do biblically. This is who God has called us to be as a family of God, as an embassy of his kingdom in this world and in this place. And so today we want to look at joyful worship. We express our heartfelt praise to God. Francis Chan, who is a pastor out in California, tells of a church goer who came up to him one time and said, I, I really didn't like worship today. His response was, well, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. When we gather together, it's not about whether you like it or you felt engaged or all that kind of stuff. Those can be helpful, but ultimately we gather for worship because of God. Church is about God. Church is about our worship of him. Worship is the beginning and end of everything. God made us as worshipers. We are worshiping something or someone at all time. One theologian said this, his name is John Frame. He said, redemption is the means, but worship is the goal. In one sense, worship is the whole point of everything. It is the purpose of history. It is the goal of the whole Christian story. Worship is not one segment of the Christian life among others. Worship is the entire Christian life, seen as a priestly offering to God. And when we meet together as a church, our time of worship is not merely a preliminary to something else, as if the worship kind of gets us in the mood for the sermon. No, it's much bigger than that. Rather, it is the whole point of the existence as the body of Christ. So we see that. We see that from the beginning to the very end, that ultimately where God is taking his people, what he has saved them for, is for worshipers from every tongue, tribe, and nation to be gathered around his throne. That's what eternity will look like, is worship. So why do we read and study the Bible? For the purpose of worshiping God. We worship better what we know better. Why do we pray? Because we worship our God. Why do we give? Worship. Why do we serve? Worship. Why do we sing? worship? Why do we give as an act of worship? Why do we disciple and be discipled? So that we might become more worshipful. Why do we evangelize? Because everybody's worshiping something, and they're going to be warped and lost until they worship the one true thing, which is God. So everything comes down to worship. John Piper says in his great book, Let the Nations Be Glad, he starts off with this, this very profound statement. He says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. The reason we exist as a church is not primarily to reach the lost with the gospel or to send missionaries around the world. It's like, that's not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. 
Missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. Missions is temporary. Evangelism is temporary. Outreach is temporary. Witness is temporary. <clears throat> but missions will be no more. That worship is the fuel and the goal of missions not only informs our theology, but also our practice. If worship is the goal, then the local church is the primary instrument. Or, to use a car analogy, if worship is both the destination and the fuel of missions, the local church is the engine. Why? Because the local church is designed to be God's gathered worshipers on earth, a corporate display of his glory among the nations. So the primary reason why we're gathered here at the Journey Museum is not just to reach this community, but to being a worship, worshiping community here that is then sent out and powered by worship to draw other people into worship, if that makes sense. Worship is the goal. God is the goal. Our enjoyment of God is supreme. God creates us as worshipers. It's not just a matter of what we worship. We do worship something. It's whether we worship the right thing. We will worship something. If it's not God, then it's ourselves, it's our possessions, it's our status, or maybe it's someone else. Or maybe we worship a feeling that we're searching for. The Bible defines the human problem as fundamentally a problem of worship. It's all, full, fundamentally, it's a worship problem. Every issue that you are dealing with, every issue that the human race is dealing with, is fundamentally, at its core, at its root, an issue of worship, a flaw in our worship. Go to Romans chapter 1 for just a moment to just make my point here. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, Paul is writing his epic letter on salvation. You just can't get much more profound than Romans. I think John Piper has said that this is the greatest letter ever written. And Romans 1 tells us, uh, it first of all diagnoses the problem with the human condition. Why are things the way they are? And here's what he says, Romans 1, 18 through 32. I think I have it up there on the screen. You can look at it in your Bibles as well. Here's what he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's the human condition. We're all under the wrath of God. For what can be known about God is plain to them, meaning all humans, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. You have enough evidence in the world to know that there is someone out there that we should be worshipped. You can go anywhere in the universe, or you can go anywhere in the, in the world, and no matter how remote that tribe is, they will have a religion. It's just in the human heart to go, there is something bigger than me, and I, must, I am not right with it. Verse 21, for although they knew God, meaning humanity, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. That's the fundamental human problem. They knew there was a creator, and they don't worship him but they became futile in their thinking. It warped them. The fact that they began to worship the wrong things and not worship the one true God means that humanity began to get twisted. Creation began to get twisted. And their foolish hearts were dark. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So they exchanged the opportunity and the privilege of worshiping God and decided to worship something else. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. God said, if that's what you want, I'll let you have it. But you get the implications of it. You get the consequences. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and are consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameful acts with men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. For since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, that's worship, God gave them to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's fundamentally a worship problem. 
God is worthy of worship. God has made humanity to operate correctly under the worship of God. And humanity chose, every single one of us chose to worship something else, ourselves, some other creation. And that has warped us, that has put us under his wrath and under a really um, twisted creation. So what is worship? If we were to define it, I like Don Carson's definition of worship. This is what we're going to use today to sort of unpack what worship is. So if worship is fundamentally the problem, then right worship then is the solution. How do we enter back into a right worshipful relationship with God? Here's what Don Carson says. Worship is the proper response of all moral sentient beings to God. So that's what worship is, is the proper response to this God. Ascribing all honor and worth to their creator, to their creator God, precisely because he is worthy and delightfully so. Such worship therefore manifests itself both in adoration and in action. Okay, we're going to unpack that in a second. Both in the individual believer and in corporate worship, which worship offered up in the con- which is worship offered up in the context of the body of believers. I think this is helpful. So I think there's two components I want to look at today of joyful worship. I think Carson helps us with this. I think this bears out in scripture. Number 1 is affectionate adoration. Words that exalt God from the heart, affectionate from the heart. We really have an actual love for God, adoration. We express through words, through songs, through prayers, through conversation, comes out in our words, our heartfelt affection for God. And it's important that it's not just our words that say the true things, but that our hearts are involved in it too. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus says this about the Pharisees. And ultimately, this is a quote from the Old Testament about God's perspective on his people. He said, these people honor me with their lips. They have the adoration, they say the right words, but their heart is far from me. Therefore, in vain do they worship me. So it it has to be both of those things. It has to be words expressed to God in prayers and songs and all those different ways, but it must come from a heart that genuinely loves God. What is the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what true worship looks like. But not only is it affectionate adoration, words that come from a heart of love for God, a right heart before God, but also sacred service, actions that please God from the heart. So what I mean by sacred service is that we actually obey him. We do what he asks us to do in the way that he wants us to do. That is worship too. So worship is not just our words, both in our internal words that come from the heart, but our out, outward words, but also our actions, sacred service. James talks about this in James chapter 1, verses 22 and 27. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, and he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he's like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. For if anyone thinks he is religious, meaning a true worshiper, and does not bridle his tongue, affectionate adoration, right? Words that honor God and don't dishonor him. He deceives his heart and his religion is worthless. So if we think we're a true worshiper, but our mouths don't speak things that are honoring to God, in fact, they dishonor God, then our status, our self-proclaimed status of being a true worshiper is false. It's worthless. And then verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained for them from the world. If you want to know what true worship looks like, true worship looks like the way we speak, our words, full of affection and adoration that honor the Lord, and our actions, how we treat other people. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, right? That is true worship. So two components of joyful worship are affectionate adoration, our words that exalt God from the heart, and sacred service, actions that please God from the heart. And there's two spheres for joyful worship. Personal, that this is my responsibility all the time. 24-7, I am to be a worshiper of God from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, maybe even in my sleep, to worship God with words and actions, right? But that's not the only place. It's supposed to be corporate as well. There's a lot of the scriptures that talk about gathered worship. You get bogged down in the book of Leviticus. That is all about corporate worship together. There's so much of the Bible that's about corporate worship. The Psalms are meant to be sung corporately. 
The overwhelming emphasis of the scripture is giving us instruction on how to worship God corporately. In fact, when we get to Revelation, as we read just a few minutes ago, it's not a bunch of individuals worshiping the Lord individually, but a multitude of people, right? So it needs to be both individual and corporate. In fact, one of Jesus' biggest criticisms of the, of, the, um, of the Pharisees was that they were hypocrites. On the outside, they claimed to be true worshipers and they said the right things at the right time. But the inwardly, they were full of dead men's bones. And they heaped burdens on other people, making them twice the son of hell that they were, right? So it's all about the heart. It's all about affectionate adoration, sacred service from the heart, both personally and corporately. So that brings us now to Psalm 103. Let's go to Psalm 103. And I want to show you an example of affectionate adoration from this Old Testament passage. Psalm 103 is described by some as being like the Mount Everest of the Psalms. If you had just Psalm 103, one theologian said, you would have enough to fuel Christian worship for thousands of years. It is so amazing. It is, it is such a beautiful psalm, and I just want to pull it apart. We're not going to dissect it ver, in very much detail, but I want it to leave an impression on you. When it talks about joyful worshipers and what we're to look like as joyful worshipers, Psalm 103 is a beautiful example of what it looks like to have affectionate adoration for God. Look at Psalm 103 verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The word bless is, in Hebrew is barak. It means to kneel down, to put yourself in a posture of worship. So soul, submit yourself to God. Bow down before him. My soul in Hebrew is nefesh. It's the center of my life. It's my existence. It's my heart. It's the core of my being. It's the control center of my life. I'm going to bow down the control center of my life, my decision-making, my attitude, my actions. Everything is going to be bowed before the Lord to serve him. And it's amazing because he's actually arguing with himself here. Like this is him talking to himself. Any of you get caught talking to yourself? Or someone catches you talking to yourself? And you're like, okay, well, there's something up with that guy, but... Well, that's what's happening here. We are given permission here to talk to ourselves because he's arguing with his soul. He's arguing with his sluggish, atrophied soul to do what it's made to do. Wake up, soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. He is using what he knows about God to try to stir up his heart to go, hey, I do not in my own natural strength bow and yield to God, and so I have to kind of preach to myself. I've got to stir myself up. And so he begins to preach truth. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, because he knows the default position of his heart is to forget, is to forget what God has done, to forget how wonderful and gracious he is. And so he's trying to stir up his own soul with truth about God. He's using what he knows, his knowledge, to stir up his heart to be rightly responding to the Lord. And here, then he just begins to bombard his soul with truth. Look at this. He stirs up his own soul with truths about God that he has personally experienced. Psalm 103, 3 through 9. So here he's arguing with his soul, who forgives all your iniquity, soul, who heals all your diseases, soul, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So he's talking about, hey, just think of what this God has done for you, soul. He's made you alive. He's given you forgiveness. He's promised healing. He's redeeming your life. He's crowning you. He's satisfying you. It only makes sense to bless him. But God doesn't just work this way about me, but towards others as well. So immediately as he begins to think about the salvation that he has received from God and how the right response is worship, he almost reflexively then begins to think about how God has extended salvation, not just to him, but to others. He begins to think not just individually, but corporately. Look at verses 6 through 9. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. So he begins to think about the character of God and God, how God has demonstrated himself in actions, not just to him personally, but to others. And so he's stirring up his own soul with truths about God. He's praising God. He's like, I'm going to worship God even when I'm not feeling it. I'm going to worship God until I start feeling it. I'm going to stir up my soul with truth about God, thinking about what he has done in the past. And then in verses 5 through 19, he stirs up other souls with truth about God. So then it all of a sudden moves corporate. So no longer is, it, is he content with just getting his own soul to worship the Lord. He's like, other souls should be worshiping the Lord. So then he begins to 
move outward. So it goes from talking about his own soul, arguing with his own soul, to now beginning to look at his community, his family, his church family, his, rel- his religious community. And he looks at this. He begins to stir up other souls with truth about God. Look at verse 10. He says he does not chide, or he does not deal with us. I'm sorry, this is uh, verses 10 through 19. Sorry, I said five a minute ago, but 10 through 19. He does not deal with us. Look at the corporate language here. He begins to kind of draw others into his worship. He's not content with just being a worshiper alone. He needs to share that worship with others. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us to our, uh, according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But... God doesn't just work this way for us as a people, but for all peoples. So you just see how like this little ripple effect is him arguing with his own soul that I should be a worshiper of God for all that God has done for me. He is worthy of my worship. And it just inevitably begins to ripple out from there. Those ripple effects go, well, I'm not content with just worshiping alone. I want my people to worship the Lord. And oh, actually all peoples should worship the Lord. Look at verse 17. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. It's a global cosmic kingdom. So it moved from, hey, soul, he has forgiven your sins to now he is the ruler of all things. You see, his worship just continues to grow and grow and grow as he thinks about the character of God, the redemption of God. He's a forgiver. He's a healer. He's a redeemer. He's a crowner. He's a satisfier. He's a renewer. He works righteousness and justice. He looks out for the little guy. He makes his ways known to the people. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He will not always be angry. He does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. He's the ruler. He's high above the earth. His steadfast love is immeasurable. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions from us. He shows compassion. And so he just continues to stir up his soul with affectionate adoration of the one true God. And there's something about doing that that begins to straighten out our hearts and our lives. We must be daily worshipers of God or else we'll get warped and we'll begin to do things, we'll begin to um, possess things, we'll begin to get warped in our thinking and we can't find our way out. And then you look at verses 20 through 22, he stirs up all creation to worship God. So it goes from, Worship, stirring up his soul to remember how he has personally experienced the grace of God and how that should motivate his worship, but then it has moved out to go, no, it's just not just his people, but actually the whole cosmos, the whole order of things should be worshipers of God. So then he gets so audacious that he begins to boss angels around. He went from bossing his own soul around to now, look at what he says in verse 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Come back to himself, and may I be a worshiper too. It's just amazing how there's so much packed into this. There's so much theology. There's so much remembrance of God's word. But it isn't just like a mindless Bible knowledge thing. It's, no, this is meant to be worship. This is a fuel for worship. These are reasons to worship. And he gets to a point where he is not content until he sees all of creation worshiping the Lord as it should be. And notice what part of that worship is in verse 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, his mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. There's the actions, right? It's not just our words, but our actions. Angels, you better do what God asks you to do as an act of worship. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers, who do his will, right? So it's not just saying things but orienting our life to where our actions, our attitudes are conformed to Jesus, conformed to joyful worship of the Lord. Let me give you a quick example of sacred service from the New Testament. Look at Romans chapter 12. We looked at Romans chapter 1 for just a moment and said that the fundamental human problem is a worship problem and that human beings have been given over into their sin and they're unable to come alive to a true worship of God on their own. So God sent his one and only son, Jesus, who came, 
live the perfect life as the true worshiper, right? As the true one, the one who worshiped God perfectly and then on the cross died for our sins of not worshiping him rightly. And then he rose again and we are called to worship him. And so as Paul unpacks that for 11 chapters, just essentially recounting the mighty works of God through Jesus to transform false worshipers into true worshipers. He comes to Romans chapter 12 after going through all this theology and then he goes, here's the right response. Here is what true worshipers do. Having repented of our sin and put our trust in Christ, what do we do? Romans 12 is a chapter about worship. It's a chapter of what it looks like now. In light of all that God has done for us, like in Psalm 103, what should we do? What should we be like? And here's what he says, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In Greek, it's literally your own logical ministry. It's, it's, it's the logical result. If God has done this for you, then you owe him your entire self. Not just some words every once in a while on Sunday, sung mindlessly, but your whole self. Put your whole life, everything about you, up on the altar, a living sacrifice that daily you give yourself entirely as a worship offering to him. Your actions, your attitudes, your Facebook profile, your everything is a response to his mercies. It no longer belongs to me, it belongs to him. So it's sacred. It's ordered by God for the honor of God. It is your reasonable service. It is your spiritual worship. This is what true worship looks like, is to give your whole self to the honor of God because of what he's done for you. It's only logical. And let me just read the rest of this. I'll try not to comment too much. But verses 2, really through the end of the book, but I'll just go through verse 32. (laughs) No, not through 32. Sorry, wrong page. Through verse 21. And just here, as he unpacks verse 1. Because the rest of the chapter is actually just unpacking what this means to be a living sacrifice. In response to God's mercy, my whole life belongs to him. My whole life is to be sacred service unto him. He then unpacks what he means by giving your life in worship to him as reasonable service. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's a worshipful thing, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned you. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So he's talking about how we treat each other as members is an act of worship. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them as acts of worship, whatever we have. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, speak words of worship. If service, do it in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So all of that is worship. All of that. Everything is worship. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Have a competition to see who can give the most honor to someone else. Not trying to get honored for myself, but I come to church not looking to be honored, but to honor. I just want to build up my brothers and my sisters. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. That is a worshipful response. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. All of that is just unpacking what it looks like to be a living sacrifice as a logical result of having been saved by God. This is what worshipers look like. 
This is what they do. And so we have from Psalm 103, we have affectionate adoration, songs and prayers and words to God about how great he is from the heart and actions that are worshipful, that we're loving our brothers and sisters. We can't call God Father and not call other Christians brothers and sisters, right? And to worship him, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength also means I love my neighbor as myself. That's worship. Worship is not just the songs that we sing here together. It's our whole life. Our words and our actions oriented joyfully in response to what God has done for us to glorify him. <clears throat> so in terms of application, here's some things that we can take away from this. As we seek to be a people who are about joyful worship, first is this. God is serious about worship and so should we, on his terms. Worship is not just the music, although that's hopefully one aspect of worship, and whether I like it or I don't like it, or I really, it really made me feel what I wanted to feel. No. God is serious about worship, and so should we. So much of our Bible is about worship. In fact, the biggest book of the Bible, the Psalms, is a worship manual. All the different ways, all the different ways we can express words to God. Words of pain, Words of confidence, words of joy, and words of sorrow over and over again. God is serious about worship, and so should we. We see how serious God is when he constructs the temple and the tabernacle of how important worship be done in a way that honors him according to his word and his will and his way. So may we not be flippant about worship. Flippant with our words, flippant with our actions, flippant with our time together in gathered worship. Worship starts and ends with truth about God. I don't know if you noticed that, but in Psalm 103, he's stirring up his soul by reminding him of who God is like. It's all about God. It's not about me and my feelings. It's about him. I start with him and his character. And the response of worship comes in chapter 12 of Romans. After all of this discussion of what God has done to redeem a people through Jesus Christ, he then says, this is the right response. We must... First, think about God before we think about our response to him. God demands that all worship come from a right heart. Again, we talked about this, that Jesus' biggest critique was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. They claimed to be true worshipers. They claimed to be leading people in true worship, yet their insides were hard. They were one thing on the outside and a different thing on the inside. And he hated that. And you see that throughout the Old Testament where people are just going through the motions, but they don't actually have a real intimacy and affection for God. And even the psalmist says, hey, I'm prone to do that too. We, read, we sang that in the song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave thy God I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Like, make me a worshiper. Give me an affection for you that doesn't wait. Take my heart, Lord, take and, take and seal it, seal it for your courts above. Make me the kind of worshiper now that I will be in eternity. Get me there. Keep me there. And when our hearts worship truly, our whole life will show it. You can tell people who are really worshiping God from the heart because their whole life begins to change. The way they treat people, the, way, the things they say, the things they do, how they respond to people, it begins to look more like Romans 12. This is the reasonable response of someone who has been redeemed by Jesus. And the reason we don't act those ways is because we have shrunk our view of God right? We've lost his majesty. It's a little bit like we need to go back to Psalm 103 and stir up our soul again to go, hey, your life is an act of worship to this great God. Let me remind you of what this God is like, right? And when the scriptures speak far more, the scriptures speak far more about corporate worship than individual worship. So we as individual Christians ought to give ourselves to being worshipers individually, but often we treat church as pretty casually, we don't really prepare our hearts to enter into worship together. We don't really think about what is really happening when we're gathering to worship together, either on Sunday mornings as the primary gathering or at other times. But God is pretty particular about his gatherings, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, about what it's to be like as we gather together. Churches should, therefore, orient their gatherings around the scriptures. Ever since the Protestant Reformation, careful Protestants have tr traditionally argued that Scripture requires a limited number of elements, basically about five things, that should be a part of what Christian worship looks like in the church. We sometimes call this the regulative principle. 
that we don't just get to decide whatever it is that we want to do in church that might make us feel a certain way or might connect with our audience. Those things may or may not be helpful. The most important things, these are the things that must guide Christian worship. These are the things that work in China. These are the things that work in North Korea. These are the things that unite Christians across time and space. They've worked in every century to build God's people. These are the elements of worship. And it should be this, that we read scripture, that we hear the gospel preached, that we pray with and for each other, that we sing praise, and that we celebrate baptism and the Lord's Supper together. Those are the five things. We don't have a lot of time together, so we don't do a lot of other things than just those, but the scripture demands that we worship God in these ways, that we read the Bible, that we preach the Bible, that we sing the Bible, that we pray the Bible, that we celebrate what the Bible tells us to do in the Lord's Supper that, that is what the Lord shows, that that's what the Lord's church is to be about. That's what true worship looks like as we're gathered together. No dog and pony shows, no pyrotechnics, no fog machines, no rambling about, but sacred, joyful worship of the Lord, a service that consists of serious application of the word of God to the people of God for the glory of God. That's what our gathered worship is to be about. So here's just a a couple of questions for us to think about is, am I truly, I want you to think about this, am I truly a joyful worshiper of God? When I read through Psalm 103, do I go, that, that is the experience that I want. That's the experience of God that I want. Am I truly a joyful worshiper of God? And if you kind of look at your life and go, man, I, I, I don't know. (laughs) Like, it doesn't feel like very much of my time or energy um, is spent in this kind of thing that you're describing, Josh. This, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Well, the right answer is not to try harder, but to go to Jesus, to repent, and to behold his glory. He says, we are transformed from one degree of glory by beholding Jesus. You just need more of God's grace, more of his, more of his word into your life. Because the... The way that the psalmist in Psalm 103 gets his heart stirred up is by talking about God. He doesn't try to muster it up in his own strength. Just by beholding God, we're like, oh, drawn to him. So am I truly a joyful worshiper of God? Not according to my definition or feelings, but by God's, by what his word says. And let me ask this, are we truly a joyfully worshiping church? Someone were to walk in, doesn't know Jesus, and they experience our worship together, would they go, oh, truly God is among them here. They have prepared to worship God together, and when they worship together, there is something that I can't put my finger on that looks different than a concert, that looks different than something the world can provide. There is something sacred about the way these people sing and pray and gather and have conversation. There is an affection in their words and the things that they say that it just overflows out of them. And there's something in the way they act and treat one another that seems so sacred, right? Those two things, affectionate adoration and sacred service just marks these people like truly God is among them. I'm not even sure there is a God, but I see these people and I see the way they gather and they worship and I see their attentiveness. I see their heartfeltness. I see the way that it seems to just consume them. And that doesn't mean that we're like crazy over the top or we're, you know, all that kind of stuff. It could be but just that it's real, it's genuine, it's real affectionate adoration and real sacred service. Is that the kind of church that we're known for? That going, hey, I don't know, I don't know what to make of those redeeming grace people, but I just know that they worship God there. Man, they are worshipers of God. And once they walk out of there and I see them at their workplace or in the neighborhood, man, they worship God everywhere that they are. Am I a worshiper of God Are we a worshiping church? Let us consider using Psalm 103 and Romans 12 as fuel, as direction in prayer and community. Let's maybe think about going to these passages regularly throughout the rest of this week and calibrating our hearts individually towards the worship of God. And then also I think there's some books out there. I've got like a hundred of these things called How to Walk into Church, which is really just a wonderful way to think about being a true worshiper. How am I preparing myself to enter? How how can I, in my own individual way, be the kind of person that is worshiping God individually, and then when I'm walking into church, 
and I'm coming into corporate worship, I'm helping facilitate, I'm helping participate in something that is full of affectionate adoration and sacred service. That little book is really just about what it looks like to be positioned to worship God as he uh, calls us to. So I encourage you to take that and just mark up some things that might be helpful to you. And so I want to give us just a moment to bow and to pray. And we're going to transition to one of the elements of true worship of God's church, which is the Lord's Supper. And I want us to approach it worshipfully as a reminder of like what Psalm 103 said, which is that he forgives all of our sins. He heals all of our iniquities. He redeems our life from the pit. He crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies us with good. The Lord's Supper represents that he has worked righteousness and justice for us. That he has been merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That as this represents the body and blood of Christ given for us, it demonstrates, it's a picture, it's an experience of God's gracious attributes towards us. That he has not dealt with us according to our sins. He dealt, he dealt with Jesus according to our sins and he deals with us not according to our sins. He has not repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is a steadfast love for those who fear him. He's removed our transgressions from us. He has shown compassion on us like his children. He knows how weak and small we are that we can't save ourselves. And so in his consideration, he sent Jesus to us. His steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. His righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep covenant. This is a meal of the covenant. He has kept covenant with us. And by taking this, we are um, appreciating and engaging in that covenant ourselves. And so take just a moment to just worship the Lord in your own hearts, to prepare your own heart for taking the Lord's Supper together and ask him, ask him to transform your heart, to stir you up with greater love and affection for him, with affectionate adoration, sacred service, both individually and corporately. Let's respond to him.